Our next speaker is Jacob West, who leads Microsoft UK's health and life sciences business. Jacob's a senior leader with board level experience and international experience as well in government, healthcare and not-for-profit sectors. And he's advised two UK prime ministers on health policy. He's got a track record of driving innovation and change in the NHS on both a national and local level. Most recently, he's served as Executive Director of Healthcare Innovation at the British Heart Foundation. Um, Jacob, great to have you here with us. Thank you so much. Over to you. Thank you, Greg, and great to be here. So I'm really delighted to be here today. Um, I'm Jacob West. I head up Microsoft's health and life sciences business in the UK. And today I'm going to talk about AI. I'm going to start by going back to the pre-hype era, then jump forward to the present day to try and cut through the hype by talking about some real-world applications of AI in healthcare, in COVID, in cancer, in mental health, and the patient experience. And then finish with maybe just a bit of hype with my dream of intelligent health systems. So let me start by going back in time to 1980, 1989. There was a lot of change that year, not least the collapse of the Soviet Union and the fall of the Berlin Wall. Meanwhile, in South London, a 10-year-old Jacob was having his five minutes of brush with, with chess fame, an exhibition match with then reigning world chess champion Gary Kasparov. That's me standing to the right of Gary. Later that year, Gary defeated Deep Thought, a prototype chess computer developed by IBM. But just eight years later, I sat transfixed as many did as he was defeated by its successor, Deep Blue, the first time a computer had ever defeated a world chess champion. And to Kasparov, at least, it didn't represent brute force artificial intelligence. He saw something more characteristically human at play. Rolling forward 30 years or so, my chess ambitions had stalled, I'm afraid and I'd built a career in public service. More significantly, AI was no longer a marginal topic for chess nerds like me. In fact, according to the boss, AI is technology's most important priority and healthcare its most urgent application. I love that quote. So let's talk about four practical examples of how AI is responding to that urgent need. Let me start by talking about Sensine Health and COVID. Sensine creates AI algorithms using de-identified and anonymized patient data. Its product, Magnify, is a deep learning, cloud-based algorithm that can read lateral flow tests, which are sometimes too faint to see by the human eye. Individuals take a photo of their test with a, with a um, camera. It's read by the algorithm, with a result returned to the user in a fraction of a second. Built on Microsoft Azure for scalability and speed, it delivers an average speed of 20 milliseconds per test. That's more than 500 tests per second. And a clinical study in the NHS showed that nearly 25% of positive tests in the study were correctly identified by the algorithm, but missed by the human reader. So a big opportunity there. And it's already been scaled. About half a million tests uh, uploaded to the Department of Health Reporter Test website. Moving on to cancer. Project InnerEye, developed by Microsoft Research with Adam Brooks Hospital in Cambridge. It's an AI software tool um, that's developing targeted radiotherapy plans. So when we talk about cancer treatment, there's really three main ways of treating it. Surgery, chemotherapy, or radiotherapy. And for radiotherapy, it's really critical that you kill as much of the cancer as possible, but as little of the healthy tissue. And InnerEye allows oncologists to achieve 3D contouring of patient scans in minutes rather than the hours that it traditionally takes. In fact, 13 times uh, less time to develop those scans. And this enables them to develop a highly targeted radiotherapy plan, higher quality, more consistent, and saving the system resources. Excitingly, this technology is now being rolled out across the NHS. And in our commitment to democratizing AI, it's available as an open source toolkit on GitHub. Let me move now to mental health and talk about IESO. You all know there's a huge demand for, for, for talking therapies, cognitive behavioral therapy, and in the UK is, is no different there. And that demand's only gone up during the pandemic. I'm told that more than two in five GP appointments involve mental health issues. 
and those who are waiting can face very long waits. So to address the issue of access, IESO developed virtual one-on-one -on -one CBT sessions with qualified therapists. And in delivering that digital service, they've developed this very comprehensive data set, more than 250,000 therapy hours, that provides them with uh, the opportunity to develop AI on, on, top of that, on top of that data. And what they've done, using advanced statistical te techniques, including deep learning, is to find out what motivates patients to recovery, what works for them, and what keeps patients engaged in therapy. They can forensically create the content of the therapy, even a therapy barcode or fingerprint. Um, this creates an unparalleled data training set, 33 million utterances, 400 million words on which to train its AI. And it's built a clinical decision support tool which gives therapists a better chance of making an accurate diagnosis and delivering more effective treatment. It's now working in over 70 NHS trusts and 70,000 patients and producing clinical recovery rates that are 30% better than the average. Finally, let me talk about the patient experience. Nuance is a pioneer and a leading provider of ambient clinical intelligence, who in a few months' time, all being well, will be a fully-fledged part of the Microsoft family. Many of you may be users of Nuance software without knowing it through its voice recognition software. But Nuance Dragon Ambient Experience, that's DAX, takes this to the next level. It uses the latest advancements in ambient sensing technology and AI to create a fully voice-enabled and ambient exam room environment. This can transform the patient-physician encounter, allowing healthcare professionals to focus on a better patient experience. Where it's deployed, patients love it, and so do physicians. And that's really important, right, with issues of physician burnout and patient experience so prominent in the news. So let me bring this to life with a short video. When patients are at their most vulnerable, when they're sick, when they're scared, they want to know that the physician is focusing on their needs, not worrying about what's in a computer screen. I think having more face-to-face -face contact is going to make patients feel more valued. Every minute that I spend doing something on the computer is a minute I'm not spending with a patient. I don't know that extra piece of information that could have led to a better health outcome. Burnout isn't just from patient care. It's from all the other things documentation, billing, coding. It leads to impacting you at home. When your kids want to play with you, you're not as acceptable or receptive to their desire to play. Ambient clinical intelligence will allow the patient visit to work the way it should. This AI will enable us to keep the more important things in the relationship and make the documentation a bit more secondary. Our EMR has provided us a lot more transparency with patients. If we have labs done that day, then they're able to go back in and use that as a source document. Having this type of artificial intelligence would improve my time with the patient and provide the care that they need. Nuance and Microsoft working together, that partnership builds my confidence that we'll really be able to meet the needs of our patients. It's gonna advance this technology at a speed I don't think we would have been able to accomplish. So four practical ways there in which AI is changing healthcare today. I promised you a bit of hype, but before I do that, Let's inject a note of caution about the current use of AI in healthcare. Four things I wanted to highlight. Firstly, the modal use of AI at the moment is in imaging and diagnostics. That's great, but it does raise questions about uh, the applicability of AI in other use case contexts. Secondly, we do know there are issues of AI and, and replicability. It works great in proof of concept, but when you move it to another uh, situation, you can't always deliver the same results. What's going on there and how do we address that? Thirdly, point solutions versus integration into wider clinical workflows. This is a critical issue with any change in healthcare, and AI is no different. And then finally, is the system ready for it? Think about it. One in five hospitals in the UK is still largely paper-based. Uh, so we've got a long way to go in getting some of the infrastructure right, getting the data ready before we use some of these tools in some instances. But if we can address that, what might the future hold? And how could we start to scale and integrate these technologies? The geneticist Richard Dawkins once said, biology is an increasingly a branch of technology. I would go one further. I think the availability of multimodal data powered by AI and other new technologies is driving the convergence of healthcare, 
technology and biomedical research. And that's only been accelerated by COVID. With the patient at the center, I would say this is what is an intelligent health system where data is fluidly ingested, curated and analyzed, where variations in that data feed a continual real-time feedback loop to inform patients, clinicians, managers, scientists and policymakers, and where a single digital health infrastructure connects patients, caregivers, healthcare professionals, providing personalized advice and feedback. A couple of examples that illustrate how we're on the way towards that convergence, even if it's a little further in the future. Wearables and sensor technology in your own home and outside it mean that healthcare can increasingly take place on your terms, in your home or wherever you go. Advances in synthetic biology mean that you can effectively print molecules or, or test new treatments on artificially grown organoids. And the scale, pace, diversity and nature of clinical trials is being transformed by enhanced computing power and consumer facing technology. Of course, all of this is underpinned by the data, genomic, phenotypic, imaging and so on, which is growing exponentially. A medical article published every 30 seconds, the, the sum knowledge of um, biomedical science doubling every couple of months. I think last year I heard the CEO of one of the large pharma companies saying that it accumulated more data in the first quarter of that year than they had in their history. Imagine that. But only now do we have the computing power and the tools to make sense of this data. I would say that's an exciting future, whether you're a chess nerd or not. And I'm looking forward to working with many of you to help realize it. Thank you. Jacob, thank you so much. Uh, I'm sure we're actually being joined by uh, many health nerds out there in the wide audience. Um, Kai Fu was just talking earlier on about sort of the hype cycles that AI kind of works in. So I'm interested to get your thoughts um, around AI in healthcare and, and whether the kind of the excitement sometimes outpaces the actual practical applications of it. I'm sure that's right. There's a, there's a hype curve for everything new. Um, and, and, I th and while I talked about some practical examples, I think one of the interesting things that's going on is that some people think it's a zero sum game, right? Either you, can, you have AI or, AI or you don't achieve any progress. I, I would say there is actually a halo effect around the discussion around AI that means we are having a more sophisticated and a better debate about the fundamental requirements that support techniques like AI, getting the right data in place, getting the right infrastructure in place, having the right computing power. And that's a good thing because actually many of the problems we're trying to solve don't need very sophisticated AI. They need better data science. Um, and I don't, like I said, I don't think it needs to be binary. Um, but if the direction of the debate means that we can have a more intelligent debate about that wider issue of data, data science, and the impact it can have, then so much the better. I do think there are some quite prosaic issues um, that, that AI can help with. It started largely in imaging and diagnostics. How about we think about some of the, the unsexy topics in healthcare and how AI can be deployed to help it? I think that's a real fertile de debate to be had there. And Obviously, during the pandemic, we saw the kind of like the enormous sort of growth or the switch, I should say, to, to telemedicine and other ways of using tech in the healthcare industry. Do you think that COVID has generally just sort of really driven that digital transformation of, of the healthcare industry? That's right. It was it was a huge step forward, wasn't it? And, and I think the, the really interesting question is how much of that can we bottle uh, and how much of that do we want to bottle? Yeah. So, Three, three dimensions to that, I suppose. I, probably the most visible representation of digital transformation in healthcare during the pandemic was in virtual consultations. So I think in, in the UK, they jumped from around about 15% for GPs to, to over half of consultations being, being um, virtual. But, but a second area, I guess, that perhaps got less attention is around home testing. So we're all used now, aren't we, to doing lateral flow tests at home, uh, and there is both the sort of physical and digital infrastructure to support that. That, was, that would have been unheard of uh, uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, maybe the preserve of sexual health services where people didn't want to present in person. So how can we use that new infrastructure, both physical and digital, uh, to take a step forward you know, under, con under peacetime conditions, if you like, beyond the pandemic? Sure. And then I think the third area um, that was tested in terms of digital transformation was the model of virtual wards. That's existed for a while, um, where you decompress acute patients 
but, but in, a, in a home or a community environment, both COVID positive patients, but also other patients. Uh, we really scaled that uh, during COVID. And I think that's terrific, particularly given the pressure on hospitals, to see, thinking about how we can uh, scale that even further as a, as a model, uh, again, that works outside of the pan pandemic as well as inside it. Sure. I'd love to get one question in from, from the audience. And uh, there's, uh, there's a question that's come in. It's really about healthcare data and, and how uh, patients can access that. But um, I, I think that maybe I'd be interested to get your thoughts on how we you know, think about ensuring that data flows across these very large sort of uh, you know, healthcare system that we have in the NHS. How can we integrate that data better so that patients get the best possible outcomes? It's a great question. And you know, going back to my point earlier about get, getting the infrastructure and the plumbing right, in, yeah. in some ways, it, it's slightly redundant having a debate about AI unless you get some of that, that basic infrastructure fixed. And we know there's both an issue around data quality, but then also connecting data uh, both within institutions. You know, I mentioned earlier that you know, one in five hospitals are still largely paper-based, but then importantly between institutions because patients, their healthcare doesn't start and end at, at the, the GP surgery or at the hospital door, it, it moves between them. Uh, and, and that's challenging. Uh, we're making some progress. I think the move towards integrated care systems in, in an English context where these organizations, where we break down some of the professional and organizational boundaries will help, but we need common standards and we need to accelerate the activity. Jacob, thank you so much for being with us today. We're still really excited about AI. Clearly you are too, and uh, we're looking forward to you know, seeing how it develops over the coming months and years. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks so much, Greg. Take care.